Hello and welcome to another exciting episode of Adventures in DevOps that might be live. I'm not actually sure. We're using some new software today and it says I'm streaming. So if you're watching this live, um, cool. Uh, I hope I don't say anything stupid and, and foolish. <laughs> I'm excited today to have uh, as my guest, Jack. Jack, welcome to the show. Would you tell us a little bit about yourself and what you do? Yeah, hey Jonathan, uh, pleasure to be here. Um, maybe live, or, or maybe not. Maybe live. The case may be. <laughs> um, but yeah, pleasure, to, pleasure to be here, and uh, thanks for having me on the podcast. Um, my name is Jack McCurdy. I am a DevOps advocate at a company called Gearset. We are a DevOps platform for Salesforce. Um, so my background. Um, over the last four and a half years has been helping Salesforce development teams um, streamline their release management practices uh, at, when it comes to uh, Salesforce development. I um, worked for Gearsack for, for four and a half years and um, doing exclusive, exclusively that and the last year and a half in my role as a DevOps advocate and that involves producing content. Um, I run my own podcast uh, as well, uh, which is called DevOps Diaries, um, and I present uh, the whole wide range of Salesforce community events and Salesforce events that you that you find in that ecosystem. Cool. I'm, I'm looking forward to learning a little bit about Salesforce and DevOps. Um, but before we dive into that, let's set the stage a little bit. Um, I imagine that many of our audience know as much or less than I do about Salesforce. So let me just sort of paint the picture of what I understand Salesforce to be and my experience with it. And then you can sort of fill in the gaps. So yeah, now, not, not, not to start the show off on a bitter note, but I lost my job to Salesforce once. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> it was okay. I was actually ready to leave the company anyway. But uh, I, was, I was managing an e-commerce team. Uh, and we got the, the entire team got basically outsourced to, to Salesforce. Uh, now, almost the entire team. Uh, my predecessor, no, sorry, my successor, uh, he's still there, actually. And manages the company uh, and and works with the Salesforce team, uh, you know that, that's mostly outsourced. It's mostly a consultancy uh, to, uh, of course, update Salesforce and so on. But I don't really have a clear sense of what he does or what they do with Salesforce. I mean, I know that Salesforce is a CRM. Um, I'm not a salesy guy. I don't really keep track of customer client relationships. So you know, a CRM is sort of a nebulous concept to me in the first place. And I imagine many of our DevOps listeners kind of feel the same way. Like that's the thing the marketing guys talk about or the sales guys talk about. Can you make it concrete? Like what is Salesforce from a technical standpoint and, and how do d Salesforce developers and DevOps engineers and so on interact with it? Yeah, that's a great question. So, so you're right. So Salesforce primarily is a CRM. So uh, a platform used for uh, managing the relationships with our customers, um, managing how they market to them, how they store their data, how they use their data to enable other business functions. So that's where Salesforce kind of starts. And that's kind of the core platform that a lot of companies use Salesforce for is the management of those relationships. However, Salesforce isn't just a CRM anymore. So Salesforce over the last over the last 20 years, um, started founded 21, 22 years ago or so now, um, has grown. And the Salesforce suite of products now is huge. So you have solutions for, for sales, for customer service, for e-commerce, for marketing, for a whole bunch of things. Um, Salesforce seemed to bring out a new product or a new, what they call cloud. Um, every, every, it feels like every month, but it's, it's not mm -hmm. often not been every every month but a different a different cloud that enables you to do different things so um what it is is about, as at its core is unifying the customer experience for for any business um but a lot of people um will use it that commonly use it will be in a, in a sales team in a marketing team or a customer success or service team um so that's that's kind of the foundation of what salesforce is now if we think about what salesforce development teams do specifically and how that relates to DevOps. So Salesforce is out, yeah, an out of the box solution. So you can buy Salesforce, you can buy one of their, their clouds um, and use that cloud to, to start uh, doing things with your customers. So you'll have a base product effectively. Um, and Salesforce developers and Salesforce, what we call admins or Salesforce administrators can configure 
their company's Salesforce instance to do any number of bespoke functions or execute bespoke business workflows. So say a, a lead comes into your company and you want to nurture that lead and how your sales reps or service reps interact with that customer. You can design bespoke workflows based on what your company objectives and goals are and how you market to those people, et cetera. So that's the responsibility of a Salesforce administrator and then a Salesforce developer. A lot of more of the Salesforce developers will write custom code and custom logic to match those business objectives and things like that, as well as increase the extensibility of the platform so that um, you can have custom websites for customers or custom experiences, uh, or custom experiences for those customers as well. So that's the core function of a Salesforce developer on the platform. When it comes to DevOps and traditional DevOps, traditional DevOps doesn't really apply to Salesforce because Salesforce hosts um, hosts all the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So things like things like standard security, standard scalability, and all those things are actually taken care of for you by Salesforce anyway, um, as a platform as a service. Now, where DevOps comes into the mix is is all about the release management and how you can seamlessly ship new features and the functionality and that extensibility that I was just mentioning about the platform to your Salesforce end users. So DevOps is an integral part of, of the release management cadence. So developers may well used to be using version control systems, may already have, may have experience using CI tooling and things like that. Um, whereas the Salesforce administrator doesn't. So a lot of the Salesforce platform is uh, clicks not code interface and clicks not code building rather than custom custom scripting or mm -hmm. writing apex code which is salesforce's development language um and as a result the methods of getting those customizations from a developer environment or what you call a sandbox in salesforce so this is like like a like a testing environment or a staging environment if you will um getting those changes out to a live production system in salesforce can be quite challenging and that's why companies like gearset exist to help with that process um, and help you build automations to get it through however many stages of sandboxes you have and out into a live environment so salesforce devops is uh, is a little bit atypical to to what the listeners of this podcast will be more familiar with um when mm -hmm. you think about devops okay fascinating so it is is Salesforce development similar to, say, uh, developing against a Google API or something like that, or or is it more um, defined? Like, like <laughs> I imagine there's APIs that you can talk to within Salesforce, but maybe it's more yeah. sandbox or something like that. I, I don't know. Maybe you can. Yeah. Make so, that more clear. <laughs> if, yeah. If we think if 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 we if we think about um, a typical. Typical, typical piece of work that a developer might do. So um, a request might come from the business and say, we want to execute this flow inside of our Salesforce environment when uh, a lead moves from this stage to this stage. This is a Salesforce developer or Salesforce admin sometimes, depending on skill sets, et cetera, and what's actually required, we'll, go, we'll pick, up, pick up that ticket and they will operate in a a sandbox environment which somewhat mimics the production environment and, and the real life environment what they'll do is they'll then add their customizations either directly in that developer environment using the clicks not code interface that salesforce has if custom scripting is required then the developer uh, will be involved and they will they will build that and then they will test it and make sure it works in their developer environment and then what they will do is they will then look to ship that and push that to a testing or uh, uh, usually another testing environment. So this will be an environment that is a lot closer to the live production environment. And best practice is for most orgs to have what they would call a UAT or staging or pre-prod sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, the naming convention varies org, org to org. And then that will be then be tested against to make sure that those new customizations that you've added will then be able to work with everything else that already exists. So um, it's very common for Salesforce to be integrated with other ERPs or billing systems and things like that. Um, so making sure that any customization that happens doesn't break those integrations and uh, integrations with other APIs um, before then shipping those changes out to production and for the end users to, 
um, to play with. How long that process takes um, varies wildly um, from organization to organization. So a lot of the larger larger enterprise companies will, will only release to production every two weeks, um, for example. Mm-hmm. Smaller organizations or more agile organizations will be able to ship changes once a week, a couple of times a week, or maybe every day, depending on how their DevOps process is set up and how fast mm-hmm. they can run through the testing requirements that Salesforce has itself or their self-imposed testing requirements or any user acceptance testing that they, they might want to do as well. Um, so yeah, so Salesforce development happens all like within the Salesforce platform and Salesforce, Salesforce gives you plenty of customizability. You can extend that customizability with custom code um, and then uh, and, and make, make Salesforce what you want it to be. No two mm-hmm. Salesforce orgs are the same. Um, unless yeah. you so happen to have two people, two, two organizations using just sales cloud or marketing cloud or service cloud right out of the box with no customizations. Mm-hmm. You can do that, but it's not recommended. And it's probably not only going to be basically fit for purpose. Okay. I'm curious. Uh, so you, you talked about uh, some organizations will release every two weeks, some as frequently as once a day or, or maybe multiple times per day. Um, is the, the ideal of continuous delivery and deployment, like in, in the sense that, a developer makes a change and everything else from that point on is automatic. Tests run automatically, everything's automatic and is deployed as soon as everything is green. Is that realistic within Salesforce or uh, or not for, for the for the reasons you were describing? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> and I might get myself in trouble trouble with with the answer here. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, can you do it? Yes. Should you do it? Probably not. <laughs> um, <laughs> so everything, everything up to everything from that initial development um, shipped to the first testing environment, everything else theoretically can then be automated and wait for every every green check to go. If you have a robust process and if you have if you have confidence in that process as well, uh, if any of those mm-hmm. checks fail. Um, it could be a fallback and it goes back to the developer for, for yeah. review and say all those green lights all those green lights are, are green um theoretically you could have a stage that automatically pushes pushes to a production environment the problem with pushing salesforce production environment live is when that happens so to, so when that happens without pressing a button to say go um, to production, a lot of the times you will want to deploy to Salesforce production environment outside of user working hours or typical user mm. working hours to make sure that if something does go bang, wrong, you can implement your rollback strategy um, or things don't just change under under a user's feet. So mm-hmm. I, the key thing about Salesforce is Salesforce is in every organization a tier one business critical application. So if you accidentally take it down, um, by having an automated deployment process and something does go wrong, even if all the green lights pass, something doesn't work as anticipated, you know, you skip um, you skip a user acceptance testing and your new business logic doesn't quite work as anticipated, confuses users, you know, you take you take out your your core business application, which can be sometimes be a thousand, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand users from prevents them from doing their job. So mm-hmm. theoretically, theoretically, yes, it is possible. Um, like a platform like Gearset or our competitors out there should be able to enable that for you. Um, however, in terms of best practice and the realistic vision for um, what Salesforce is used for in every organization, that often makes it not practical. What you can do, however, is do all of those green light checks and validate against production as well. So Salesforce has a function where you can validate a deployment package of new features to production and allow you to be able to then quick deploy that um, at a time of your choosing. So everything up until that last stage can be automated um, to, to some extent. Where the Salesforce development is, again, is, is a typical, often, um, often the less mature delivery teams won't use something like version control. So a lot of the listeners here will be used to working with version control, and that's your de facto. Um, development method um, working in those branches, but because Salesforce is a live, continually, continually live environment, production can actually be edited as as it is mm-hmm. by a Salesforce administrator. Mm-hmm. If you have the permissions, it's you, you're not dealing with 
it's not we have an application and we're going to ship an update to it and then you get the new version of the application the application is always live so so salesforce is source of truth if you like this is a big this is a big argument in in uh in the salesforce devops world is what is your source of truth because technically the source mm -hmm. of truth is production as it is currently live whereas teams that um, teams that are developing in a, a source driven method those your source driven method will always be a few steps ahead of production just by the nature of development but your source of truth mm -hmm. technically is as it currently exists got it so how long have you been doing your podcast? Um, so I've been doing my podcast for, well, I started in November, November of okay. last year. All right. So a year approximately. Yeah. So that should give you a pretty good amount of time uh, to, to answer my next question, which is going to be, what are some of the biggest challenges that come up uh, for uh, whether it's of perception or technical challenges, whatever, what are some of the biggest challenges that DevOps people face when interacting with with salesforce and salesforce uh deployments and teams yes um <laughs> um try and pick just one <laughs> <laughs> um so so i think uh, the you, the word that you used there was uh perception and the perception is for a lot of folks that salesforce devops is quite difficult um the to be able to do Salesforce DevOps really well and really effectively, it does involve implementing version control. It does then extend to automating parts of that. And the foundations of that tends to be version control. I've mentioned already a couple of times, um, Salesforce has a, has a clicks not code interface and that's how the majority of Salesforce development work is done. So Salesforce, if we look at the history of the platform and how a work traditionally traditionally went it started with clicks not code like that was all the rage um salesforce you then started to see folks move away from that and the more bespoke business processes were requested uh, developers and coding became quite heavily important so there are salesforce orgs out there that are so heavily customized with custom code um that you know that those orgs can become fairly unmanageable and that obviously increases the complexity of the DevOps process and all the checks and balances that need to happen and, and mm -hmm. make, make, making sure that code is maintained. Um, but over the last couple of years, Salesforce internally have been uh, doing this really big push to use a lot more of the, the, native, the native functionality that's built into the platform that they've built for you to revert to that uh, with clicks, not code messaging. So, mm -hmm. um, so as a result, a lot of the Salesforce ecosystem, you know, I don't really want to put a figure on it, but I would say a good 60 to 70% of Salesforce administrators um, or developers, for example, um, don't have experience coding, um, mm. which as a result makes that barrier to entry for adopting DevOps best practices quite difficult because version control, when you're trying to wrap your head around it, is I remember when I, when I first started at Gear. So I don't have a tech background, like I'm not a mm -hmm. developer myself. Um, when I came to Gear set four and a half years ago, I had to wrap my head around version control and um, the what Salesforce DevOps best practices look like in comparison to how our engineers were working. Um, and version control is quite a scary concept. And that barrier of entry, that initial barrier to entry, I think is quite high. Um, and that learning curve can be quite steep. And that's something that we've, uh, made quite a concerted effort to do at Gearset is build a platform. So we have a learning platform related to Salesforce DevOps called DevOps Launchpad, um, which highlights version control fundamentals, how to get started with version control for, for Salesforce and things like that. But that. That barrier to entry can be can be quite high. Mm -hmm. The I think the other biggest challenge for any Salesforce team looking to change the way that they're working is a cultural thing. So this is where, so I have a, I have a counterpart at Gearset called Rob. He is a Salesforce developer and architect by trade and that's his background. He's very super technical. Whereas a lot of my career, um, I focused a lot more on uh, business change and culture change. Um, and there is this, in a lot of teams, this, this process inertia, you know, we've always done it this way and we're so scared of 
this thing looks quite DevOps looks quite hard and quite difficult to difficult to implement. And we've always done it this way. Yeah, it's pretty painful, but um, it works. Um, it's not optimal, but it works. Um, that we've always done it this way. Mindset can be quite hard to change because uh, typically a lot of teams tend to be risk adverse. Um, there's a lot of challenges on the platform as it is. Let's not mess with anything. Um, so driving people to see and envision that there is a better way of doing things, it requires a little bit of upfront work and a bit of upfront effort to change, but it can be done. I think is one of the other, other biggest, biggest challenges and drivers behind that. Um, so yeah, that, cult that cultural piece is, absolutely absolutely huge um mm -hmm. and it starts with uh it starts with the people so but if you have the people there and you invest in the people and their learning journey um the importance the importance of salesforce devops and the benefits of salesforce devops and users getting features faster and things like that really starts to come into the fold if if that if you have i guess execs and sponsorship is, is a big thing the exec sponsor has got you've got to have somebody that says yes this is a good idea from a slightly higher level and mm -hmm. especially in those larger teams to say hey yeah we do want to do this we do want to improve everybody's lives we want to at the end of the day improve our end users lives and you know adopting best practice devops does change the salesforce delivery team's lives we it's, it was a common thing. So I used to, I used to sell Gearset's products. So I used to be an account executive and help build the sales team at Gearset. Um, commonly, I would speak to Salesforce teams and their developers and admins will be, would be up at 2, 3 a.m. in the morning doing a deployment. Um, mm. It would take 10 hours to do a production deployment because of how quirky and challenging the system is to deal with. And then when they implement a solution like Gearset, for example, or uh, any, of our, any of our competitors, that brings it down to do it two hours. And you know, being able to go home at 7 p.m. on a Friday rather than 11 p.m. Um, those are very, very real, real life stories um, that you hear pretty frequently uh, in this space. Um, so yeah, that was that was a bit of a rambly answer to to what was a fairly simple question. <laughs> That's a, no, it wasn't a simple question. I mean, it's a simple question, but I expected a fair amount of uh, nuance. I'm curious, maybe. Um, I don't know how much you want to talk about your career, but I'm curious how you got interested in DevOps in Salesforce. You know, how, how did you know? You talk about being an account executive, and you know, so you it sounds like your career has taken a more of a technical turn at some point. H how did that happen? Yeah, that's a, it's a really interesting, a really interesting story. Um, I think so. My background prior to uh, prior to Gearset, well, uh, I did a bunch, a bunch of different different things beforehand, but predominantly mm -hmm. I was in, did retail sales, I did, uh, I did some work for a local utilities company, I did, uh, and the job that I had before Gearset was as a recruiter, so I specialized in building architecture and design, um, not architecture as we as IT people think about architecture, um, so I did that for, for three years, and an opportunity came up to to work at Gearset in in the early days. So uh, Gearset was thirty odd people um, when I joined the company um, in March of 2019. An opportunity came up came came up to be a recruiter. So um, spoke to the CEO and went through that whole process. And um, they ended up going with somebody else for the recruiter role. Um, and the CEO turned to me and he said. Um, given it's somebody else with a little bit more experience based on what we need and what we do but we really like you and think you could do a good job on our sales team do you want to come and do that instead and at this point i was just like i was sold on gear set like the company the culture was amazing and i really wanted to be a part of that um and you know uh, and entry into a tech startup you know is what uh, a lot of a lot of folks are striving for these days you know um you know tech startups seem to be seem to be one of the places that a lot of people strive for, especially coming out of college or university these days anyway. So, um, so yeah, so why not, I'll take a shot. So came to Gearset, joined, joined the company. We were about 30 people back then. Um, and when I say sales, but like, don't, don't turn off when I say sales, uh, folks that are listening, you know, so we're not that scary, I promise. Um, but sales at Gearset was a little bit different, um, different back then. So whilst my time was account executive, what we were really was an account executive and a solution engineer kind of wrapped up into one. Um, so we as account executives did the demos. So often folks, if you've ever been on a product demo um, for any of the other software that you might be investigating or, or currently use, you will 
have an account executive that does a bit of a pitch and a bit of a sale. Uh, and then you'll, that will get taken over by a sales or a solution engineer, which will then demo the product and talk to you about all the technical nuance of the tool and the platform and the problems that you're solving. Um, at GearSet, we were account executives and solution engineers all in one. Um, so me and my colleague, a uh, few of my colleagues were, were that. And the sales team, so as a result of that, I got quite embedded into the technical issues um, that folks face um, on the platform. Um, you know, growing startup kind of wore different hats in customer success as well. So often um, in the early days, I would be uh, doing customer support as well when I had a spare minute and they, we needed support. Because so all of our support is done by Intercom, um, which is a chat widget in the app itself. Um, so in the early days, I'd be in there and helping debug issues with customers that they might be facing. So a lot of the early days working for a startup gave me a lot of exposure to a lot of different things rather than just doing sales. So I helped grow the sales team there, um, helped implement different selling motions and things like that. And I was just like, there's some things that I like. There's some, there's some things that I really like about this this job and like what I do. Um, and there's some things that I don't. Like how how can I do all the things that I like doing and mm -hmm. try and abstract what I don't enjoy as much? Um, and that's how I came to 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 have the have the job that I have now. So um, I enjoy educating educating folks on DevOps. I enjoy um, presenting. Public speaking is uh, has though was terrifying in, in the beginning. It's something that I've grown to quite quite enjoy. Um, yeah. And being able to interact with folks um, in this space is, is has been really fun. Um, and it's really fun. Um, and I think it's just, it's one of those things that you embed yourself into, into an environment that fosters these best practices. Um, and then, like I say, I have a colleague, Rob, who's far more technical than I am, um, can actually code. <laughs> um, um, I, the, we have skills that complement each other. So I have a lot more experience in pitching to uh, pitching and speaking in a, in a way that an executive will understand and translate it to business value. Um, as well as having enough uh, enough technical knowledge that um, a developer or an architect or things like that will uh, also also listen to me and have a different. So being able to have two different styles of conversations um, to translate value, I guess, for everybody involved, and that's kind of how um, how it how it kind of developed. Um, I still haven't tried to try to write or script anything. Maybe that's something that I do in a bit of downtime. But I'm quite fortunate to be supported by my colleague Rob, who. Who, who handles the more technical side of uh, the topics that we cover. And a lot of what I do is based on extracting value. So I mentioned earlier in the podcast that Salesforce is, is a tier one business application. Like a, a Companies run their businesses on it at the end of the day and being able to get the most value out of that platform um, is hyper important to them. And Salesforce DevOps and good DevOps practices not only enables change faster, so digital, digital transformation and Change management is, are, you know, huge, huge buzzword. Um, mm -hmm. And DevOps, DevOps, and um, poor DevOps is actually a really big innovator for that, that inhibitor of that happening um, mm -hmm. in our space. So being able to speak to executives in that way to help them get the most business value out of what is an expensive platform like Salesforce isn't cheap. Um, it's probably the biggest expenditure in any enterprise organization. So that is that that is super important. Um, and something that I'm passionate about is is helping is is helping those folks being able to do their jobs faster, make their lives happier. Like like again, the, the amount of stories I get told about the, this is this was such a pain or is such a pain. You know, it's causing us stress and sleepless nights. And you know, you implement a solution um, to to remedy that pain, and it really gives it gives a quality of life back to people's jobs. Um, so so that's kind of a bit, bit of the journey that I've been on, and uh, we'll continue on. Sleep-driven development is a powerful motivator, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> coffee, co coffee driven development, I think, is the, mo the, the most common type of development I see. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. if our engineering team is anything to go by anyway, so. <laughs> I'm curious to learn a little bit more about GearSet. I mean, obviously, GearSet sells uh, uh, services related to uh, the Salesforce. But can you maybe elaborate on that a little bit? What, what does GearSet do? Um, you know, who, who would hire GearSet and, and what for? Yeah, so so GearSet actually has has an interesting story. So um, GearSet as it exists right now, we are uh, an all-in-one Salesforce Salesforce DevOps platform for companies that use Salesforce. Um, so when you're thinking about 
um, how do we protect our org? How do we make sure it's backed up? Um, should we have like a production disaster or what have you? Um, we have a, a backup service if you need to uh, need to move data between environments for testing or for any other reason, then we have tooling to do that. Uh, we have CI tooling, automation tooling, pipeline, uh, development pipelines, um, like you would set up in, in Bitbucket or an action similar to things like GitHub Actions, we have um, tooling for um, for Salesforce specifically. Um, but the gear set, gear set, the gear set journey is really interesting because gear set was founded by, um, so, so Kevin and Matt were software engineers at a company called Redgate. Um, you might be familiar with Redgate, or if Redgate sounds familiar, the reason for that is, is because they're a company based out of Cambridge, UK, which is where GearSet is headquartered, that um, create uh, that have database DevOps tooling um, for Microsoft tools, SQL Server, things like that. So when um, when Redgate were looking at Salesforce and doing their own Salesforce implementation, they were just like, oh, there must be a better way to do all of this than what Salesforce gives you out of the box. And that's how Gearset was founded. It was founded by, we're used to being able to do all these cool things for the Microsoft products that, that we make tool, tooling for. Let's see mm -hmm. if we can do it for Salesforce. Um, so bringing that, that engineering culture to Salesforce um, and Salesforce DevOps spe specifically um, is how Gearset is founded. So one of, uh, one of Breakgate's uh, flagship products is SQL Compare, which allows you to compare, compare, compare side by side um, those those databases, and that's what where Gearset started, being able to compare what's in a sandbox environment versus what's in a production environment, which um, can drift dramatically in Salesforce development. So that's that's kind of the journey, and um, through um, so our CEO is a software engineer by background, our CPO is a software engineer by background. We are a company that's grown from software development best practices as it is anyway. And I think that's where Gearset is kind of set apart from our competitors in this space um, is we are really uh, best practice engineering first um, and making guys, uh, Salesforce developers, Salesforce administrators, Salesforce architects, uh, Salesforce DevOps engineers, all of those people's lives uh, better. Awesome. Cool. Um, <clears throat> one other question I have um, before I ask, uh, well, getting ahead of myself. Uh, if anybody listening is interested in learning to do Salesforce development, do you have any suggestions or or, or direction tips for them to, to consider? Yeah, I do. Um, so the, the great thing about Salesforce and Salesforce development in particular is anybody can learn it and anybody can learn it for free. So Salesforce have this amazing, uh, it's like a, a, an academy, if you like. So it's called Trailhead. So Trailhead is a learning platform for any Salesforce professional, which will allow you to go and learn the basics of Salesforce. It'll teach you how to code uh, Apex for Salesforce. Um, you can you can go and you can. It's all self-learning. Trailhead.com. Create a free account. Um, you know the, there's mascots and fun trails, and they give you you get your own environments to build all of these things in, and you can learn so much about the platform. Um, so if you're interested in Salesforce development and what Salesforce is used for, and this hundreds of applications that that you can uh that you can apply to to the business then uh, trailhead is definitely the place to go if you're interested in salesforce devops and how that is different in in comparing to to, to what you what you currently do or getting best development practices then devopslaunchpad.com um is the place to go so caveat that is a platform that gearset have created as well as our learning platform however mm -hmm. it is uh it is agnostic so it is all about salesforce devops and the different different flavors of that and what's involved yes of course there's gear set gear set courses on how to use a gear set product on there but the learning journey is is super agnostic when uh when it comes to learning version control best practices um, and things like that um for the platform but yeah trailhead anybody can go and learn learn salesforce and, and develop on salesforce with the trailhead platform um it's also it's one of those things that salesforce is such an incredible incredible platform because it's because because of that low barrier to entry to learn Salesforce and that clicks not code mentality, so many people from every different background uh, can can get involved. So folks from underrepresented groups and things like that have have a free platform that they can use to start a career 
in tech and like it routinely changes changes people's lives. So there's a number of great nonprofit organizations out there um, like Pep Up Tech or Meribis um, for, for veterans um, that have learning programs dedicated to Salesforce to give give people that that leg up into technology because Salesforce is uh, Salesforce has a guidance has a guidance valuation of 36 billion or something like that as a company for the for the next year um, and the ecosystem around that will be many 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 billions more um, <laughs> so it's 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 an industry where there there's a lot of money to be made and there's a lot lot to go around and you can start a, start a career in Salesforce fairly easily um, it will take will take drive and determination if folks aren't aren't already in in that space um because it is competitive and a lot of people career transitioning they see it as um this can see it as a golden ticket i guess um but with a bit of determination and hard work all the resources out there you just got to go and get it awesome is there anything else that i should ask you about or anything important that i that we should discuss that i that i haven't uh before we move towards the end of the program um uh, it's it's all it's it's all important. I think I think, I think the biggest <laughs> thing for um, uh, the biggest thing for for folks either either looking at Salesforce. If we, if we think about Salesforce Salesforce DevOps, like in particular, like um, there is Salesforce DevOps is a challenge. So I would I would encourage anybody that's listening to this podcast or to to take a look at Salesforce DevOps, and I think there is. There is a there is probably probably a gap for um, Salesforce DevOps specific engineers and people with a really good DevOps background to to go in and and learn a little bit more about Salesforce and then help help the team transform transform what they're doing internally with that little bit of understanding. There will be frustrations because of the way that Salesforce works and some of um, some of the API limitations and things like that. However, that must methodology wise i think there there is generally a gap for um in larger enterprises you're going to see folks with that kind of knowledge anyway and uh, a lot of the, like previously previously in working working here i've done liaison with internal devops teams that don't understand why things have to be done a certain way in salesforce and you know that that relationship management is is really important when you think about think about devops for salesforce but like things like implementing robust testing um, so not just not just the testing that Salesforce makes makes you do. Um, so Salesforce has um, uh, testing. Uh, you have to have tests written for all your custom code, and have to have code coverage above a certain percentage and things like that. So it's like mandatory testing in Salesforce. But the more that you can do in terms of uh, setting up a robust testing strategy for security and load testing and uh, testing the make sure that your functional testing and the user regression testing and things like that those things and how that's incorporated into the process and where those kind of things start and you know best practices that can be taken from software development and applied to a salesforce team can be really powerful especially if you have this it's not uncommon to see three or four teams working on salesforce and they all have different processes so being able to unify and govern processes is uh, is really important um, so there is there are challenges in uh, in the Salesforce space that I think can be solved by DevOps engineers um, from from a traditional background, um, if you will. Um, so it's just, so it's really interesting. It's not for it's not for everybody, um, not for everybody for sure. But there there are a lot of interesting challenges and a lot of um, a lot of things that can be solved by um, by driven 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 people in this space for sure. Yeah. Cool. Well, Jack, how can people or get in touch with you. Are, are you on social media? Obviously, you have a podcast. Now's your chance to tell us all the all the places where you live on the internet. Yes, yeah, sure. So um, you can hear more of my voice. Um, actually, probably slightly less less of my voice. I usually let the guests do the talk, a lot of the talking. Um, it's just that the shoe's been on the other foot today, which is uh, which is quite yeah. strange. Um, um, my podcast or Gearset's podcast, uh, DevOps Diaries, which I host, is available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all those good places. Um, Exciting Times is a recently rehashed the format and then have done recorded a few video episodes, which will be on YouTube as well. Uh, you'll be able nice. to see that on the Gearset YouTube channel. Um, but yeah, DevOps Diaries, I talk a lot about 
um, Salesforce DevOps in particular uh, with my guests, um, but I also have guests come on and talk about um, cultural changes and things like that as well, um, talking about their kind of career journeys and um, burnout, mental health and all those kind of things are featured on the podcast mm -hmm. as well. Um, all the things that I think good DevOps can contribute towards improving for sure um you can find me on um on x or twitter if, if you like it so <laughs> underscore jxckmcc um providing elon hasn't burned it down in the next couple of weeks um with uh, with its new valuation that came out today which is half of what he bought it for um uh, and you can find me on linkedin as well so i post a, post a lot on across uh, both twitter and linkedin awesome well jack thanks for coming on i've Feel like i've learned quite a bit um one last thing before we end the program on this show we like to do picks so i don't know if you have anything you want to pick um i have one thing i will pick uh do you want to go first or do you want me to um you go first i'll go first okay so i'm going to pick a book uh, I, I listen to the audio format it's called the art of action how leaders close the gaps between plans actions and results and it was a really fascinating book it's it's about um well, how do I say what it's about? It's sort of some case studies dating back to pre-World War I military operations and how they can apply to business with regard to sort of a bias for action or, or how we how we can interact, how we can, uh, <clears throat> well, as the subtitle says, bridge the gap between plans, actions, and results. So it's, it's kind of uh, the antidote in a sense, or one possible antidote to the strict top-down hierarchy approach that uh, you know Taylorism may be uh, promoted. Um, so it really ties in with uh, the, the ideology of Agile and DevOps and all this sort of stuff, which is why I'm bringing it up on this show. So it's, it's, a, it's an interesting book. Uh, if you like history uh, and you like business, this is the perfect book because it really ties those two together for you. So uh, that's my pick for the week, The Art of Action by Stephen uh, Bungay, I think is how you say his name. So that's my pick. Cool. Um, I am going to take a take, take a little bit of a different angle. So um, my pick is going to be uh, actually what I watched on Netflix last night. Awesome. So I watched um, I watched Pain Hustlers on Netflix okay. last night. Um, I thought it was fantastic. Um, so Pain Hustlers is based on the true story of a, a company's rise um, of uh, rise while selling a fentanyl fentanyl spray um, and how their business practices contributed to the opioid crisis in uh, in the United States. Um, I think the best way I can kind of describe it is it's a toned down version of the Wolf of Wall Street. Um, but okay. the the toned down version of Wolf of Wall Street, but it's shot really well. The into interpersonal relationships um in that in that movie are fantastic and there's, there's some really great acting uh, it's directed by david yates so if you're a harry potter fan um i like what he did with that this is a certainly more grounded and based version of of his his way of storytelling um which i thought was really excellent so yeah pain, pain hustlers on netflix um with 10 out of 10 recommend awesome i'll check it out once again thanks jack it's been a pleasure Hope to chat to you again soon. Jonathan, thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Cheers.